That being said, Man City, I think despite selling big players, right, Mares mm. is gone, Gundogan is gone, I think the business they've done has been very good. It has been a long summer. It's felt like months. It's only been weeks. There's been plenty of transfer gossip to keep us busy. And finally, the time has come for the Premier League season to start. Welcome to the Anglo-Italian pod. As always, my name is Rory, and I am again joined by my very good friend, Adam. Hey, Rory. Hope you're doing well. Um, I don't know what the feeling or sentiment is right now, but it's good to have some football to talk about once again, right? I feel like I've never read more or heard more about teams' um, financial uh, situation, bank sheets, profits. Honestly, I know more about Wolverhampton Wanderers' finances than my own. (laughs) I'll be honest at this point. Um, I can manage theirs better than I manage my own. So it is nice to be able to talk about what's going on on the pitch. Last weekend was bloody lovely. It was a really good start for Arsenal, so that was nice. Mm. Um, but yeah, you excited for another Premier League season to kick off? I think it's going to be a, a, even more competitive than any other season. It's going to be a weird one, isn't it? Because you've got some players have gone to Saudi Arabia. You've got the kind of uncertainty with certain clubs about the way they're going to go about it because some haven't even finished their business, it feels like. Um, and we're talking about this on the eve of a bid from Bayern Munich for a certain Harry Kane as well. Is he going to go, Rory? Is he going to go or is he going to bottle it and stay in North London? I Honestly, my, my hot take or lukewarm cold take is that he's, I've put it on Twitter, he is the least ambitious elite <laughs> sportsman on the planet and he's going to stay at Tottenham Hotspur. I think mm. there's just something, I, I don't see the romance of it. I don't see the, I know I hate Spurs, but I don't see the romance of it. I don't see like, he's had every opportunity to move now. Mm. He's done the best he can for Spurs for a number of years. They've made so many promises for him. Yep. There's been four failed projects now. <laughs> so it's been the Poch project, the failed, then it was Mourinho, yep. then it was Conte. Um, and now it's going to be Ange, who everybody knows, long-term listeners will know, I absolutely love Ange. Gutted he is at Spurs. But I think if Harry Kane lets them lie to him again, he's even thicker than I thought. Like, <laughs> I just think he owes it to himself to leave. I can't <laughs> yeah. believe he wants to stay. Where, what, how do you think it's going to end? I do get this sense that he's waiting for the opportunity to leave next summer. It it just Mm -hmm. feels like that, despite the backdrop, as you say, of this one club trying their best to kind of persuade him to Bavaria. It doesn't feel like he's tempted to go. And it's such strange kind of circumstances because you think, right, what other clubs does he think he's going to get next summer? I mean, genuinely, it it doesn't feel like there's going to be many suitors for him. And I appreciate that's probably me being short-sighted, but I just genuinely feel like the top clubs aren't going to be hanging about. They'll go for younger kind of strikers, Mm -hmm. ones that probably will build on what they've got. Um, But yeah, It's a really weird one because Mm. I think he said that he doesn't want to leave Spurs without them getting money. Now I've seen. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I've seen a quote where he's. I don't want to leave the club with that. With them mm. not getting any money, but the way he's acting now seems to be he can't sign another contract at Spurs. Like cannot be if he does that. Like Jesus Christ. But I don't <laughs> think he's going to sign another contract. So no. therefore, he is choosing to leave them without any money because he will go on a free. Of course, yeah. I think the only clubs that would realistically go for him would be. I think I saw Chelsea, Manchester United, and PSG linked. Of course, Chelsea Mm, are linked. They're linked to freaking everybody. (laughs) But I think Manchester United will be an interesting one. But I honestly Mm. thought that Harry Kane wouldn't play for another Premier League team. And I think Mm. years for years I've been saying, and this isn't like wise after the event, you're just going to have to believe me. For years I've been saying that Bayern Munich would be a great fit for Harry Kane. They have a great tradition of big number nines like Luka Tony and Mandzukic and these like Lewandowski, Lewandowski these strikers that are yeah. big, domineering, great finishing, technically amazing. I think he would just mm. fit into that more beautifully. And I think I've always thought that he'd end up at Bayern Munich. And I mm. thought, I'm, I really hope it happens. I honestly really hope it happens because I think for his career, he like it's only in the last five years that anybody gives a shit about the Premier League top scoring record. I don't know when it became such a big thing. Like, 
and also it's it seems fairly basic to me, but football isn't an individual sport. Of course, yeah. If it was tennis, right? Mm. And you're like, I don't, I know nothing about tennis. I don't know why I've chosen tennis, but you're gonna win the big thing in tennis, and you've yeah. never done it. Yeah, fine. Individually, that is a big, a big deal, right? But in football, mm. no one's gonna look back and say. Lionel Messi won however many Ballon d'Ors. They're going to say he won the Champions League. He won La Liga. You, you look at Ibrahimovic, you look at Ronaldo. He's won leagues in multiple yeah. countries, whatever it is. The first thing you mention is, well, what did he do? Well, what mm. did he win? Yeah. And it's not like no one gives a crap about, like, if I was ranking the top five Premier League strikers, Alan Shearer might not come into it because... Yeah. He hasn't like he won the league once. Thierry Henry won it twice. Van Nistelrooy won it however many times. Like Sergio Aguero won it how many times? Yeah. There are strikers ahead of them because they actually won that competition. I don't know why the top scorer thing suddenly became so massive. It seems like it's been made huge as an excuse for Harry Kane not winning trophies. Yes, like since yeah. he's not won anything, a lot of comment, a lot of pundits and stuff have been like, "Oh, but this is actually like the real quiz, just to justify like what he's mm. the fact that he's not." What do, uh, do you think? I'm onto something. Do you think yeah, I'm massively yeah, definitely. wrong? I think I if we just take that uh, on the side as well, there's that argument that he hasn't actually turned up for the big games. So mm. this is the big thing that I think people miss out is that sometimes actually when he was called upon to like deliver or be the kind of talismanic kind of striker. He failed on the big stages. We saw it in the Champions League match, for example, when Spurs had that opportunity against Liverpool. You also have to remember certain semi-finals that you mm-hmm. know Spurs have entered. You know they could have done with his input, and for whatever reason, it's never been his day. And um, you kind of felt like with this like opportunity, let's call it an opportunity, he has got some platform there to not only win a title there but also potentially make a name of himself in the Champions League, right? And well, they given could, if... the amount of talent that has moved on to Saudi Arabia, mm-hmm. that could make it even easier for him to like potentially be a candidate. If Bayern Munich sign Harry Kane and they sign whoever, they were linked to Moises Caicedo again today as well, yeah. I think, right? If they sign those two players, Bayern Munich are amongst the favourites for the Champions League. They yeah. always are anyway, right? Yeah, yeah, they're always yeah. up there and they're going to slap Arsenal 10-2 in the, in the round <laughs> of 16. I know that's yeah. going to happen. But I think if Kane goes there, he's got a massive shout of winning the mm-hmm. Champions League. And I think there's also this huge hypocrisy of loads of people going, oh, Harry needs to win trophies. Harry needs to win trophies. He goes to somewhere where he could win trophies. Everyone goes, no, not that one. Not that one. Yeah. Not the Bundesliga. That's not Why? worth it. Like... Also, it's not like I know Bayern have won it ten years in a row now. It's not the most competitive league, but the Bundesliga have had more winners than the Premier League have had, yes, right? Yeah. <laughs> like they've yeah, had yeah. more teams win it. Um, so I think like it's not as uncompetitive as people think, and it's still like you ask Owen Hargreaves what it was like to play for Bayern. Oh, yeah. You ask any player what it was like to represent that team, mm. they're not going to tell you it's tin pot. Like <laughs> I just think there's a lot of like Premier League ignorance uh, that's been exposed today as well, like every yeah. other bloody day in the transfer yeah. window. <laughs> <laughs> but we will keep a keen eye on it as to what happens mm. to Harry Kane. Um, the interesting, um, the interesting ending for this, I think, is him leaving on a free and staying in England. I think that would be, I think it yeah. would genuinely go a long way to tarnishing his reputation with Spurs fans. I think they always yeah. believed he would just never play for another English team. But if he goes to Man United, and I think Man United would quite happily give him the wages and take him. Like they yeah, would, yeah. they've been eyeing him up for years, haven't they? I think mm. that would be the interesting um, outcome of this. Uh, but hopefully, Bayern can get it done, and then Spurs have four days to replace the greatest player of their modern history. Um, but hey, yeah. w- when they had all that money from Gareth Bale, they did it really well. So I'm sure they'll be fine. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be fine. But we we said we're going to talk about football on the pitch, and we've just talked about transfer business. Um, <laughs> yeah. But. <laughs> it had to be done. It had to be done. Um, so, guys, a few weeks ago, or a week ago, maybe, um, I've been on holiday. Time isn't a thing anymore. <laughs> um, I put on Twitter asking for your predictions for the Premier mm. League season. Um, I was asking for who you think will win the title, who you think the top four will be, uh, which teams will be relegated, who will be the top scorer, 
who will be the best signing, who will be the worst signing, who will be the best manager, and which team will surprise us the most. Now, that is what me and Adam today, we didn't put our opinions online. We no. saved them for you. We kept you waiting, and we're going to go through them today and give our predictions of what we think will happen. Um, so, should we take a quick break and come back with our predictions? Let's do that. Hi, I'm Phil Brown, and you're listening to the Anglo-Italian Podcast. And here we are. We're officially back. That was all the fluff, the intro. We are officially <laughs> back. It's time to talk about our Premier League 23-24 season predictions. Mm. Starting at the top of the table, Adam, I'm going to let you go first. Which team do you think is going to win the title this year? Will Man City make it four in a row? Be the first team to do that in Premier League history. Will Arsenal somehow do it and finally get across the line? Or is there another team that you think is going to sneak up behind and snatch it? What do we think? I think despite the fact that they've had a few players depart from City, I think it's going to be City's title again. Um, And the only reason I say this, Rory, is because I'm still not convinced that Arsenal have done enough in terms of the window. I feel for me... Whilst the qualities they've brought in have been good depth players, you know, players that I think will challenge the first 11, um, they are just missing a striker, which um, personally speaking, I feel that's the one area that they were lacking in last season. Um, mm-hmm. And I think if we're talking about that five point gap, do I feel with the current squads, they've got enough firepower? I feel like, yes, you've got a lot of tacking like players, but do you have someone that can finish it in the box sometimes, mm-hmm. you know? And I think there was an over-reliance that during that period where Jesus was off and Ketia came in. Do I feel confident that he could do it again? Not so sure. And I, I feel like, you know, we, we've talked offline about Kudos, who potentially might be going to Brighton, for example. Mm-hmm. That would be a hell of a signing for me to sway in Arsenal's favour. I think if you yeah, brought yeah. him in, for example, or an awesome man, for example, someone of that kind of calibre, would be enough to kind of persuade me. Um, And if you look outside of those two teams, I mean, I think it's definitely going to be a lot more of a challenging top Mm -hmm. five, top six mix, I think, this season. And that's, you know, with the regards of you've still got the likes of, say, your Villas potentially challenging behind as well. Um, But yeah, I'd be curious from your point of view. Obviously, I know you've got your Arsenal hat on as well. Um, What's your thoughts? I'm afraid... This is it. I'm afraid to predict that we're going to win it, right? Because yeah. I just don't want to jinx it. <laughs> like, and is, I'm a very suspicious man. Uh, suspicious? Superstitious man. Um, and I think I'm very, very terrified to say we're going to win it. Uh, but I do kind of think it's possible. Um, I think you're right with the striker. Um, I th- mm. But we're not going to sign a striker. That's not going to happen. So I think we are going to be dependent on what we've got. Um, the Gabriel Jesus injury is about supposed to be six weeks, but they said that last time. Arteta never tells the truth of injuries. No. He just kind of keeps it going until mm. people stop asking. Um, so we'll see how long Jesus is out for. That's going to be massive. I think with Nketia, it's interesting. because I think if Balogun came in and mm-hmm. put up the same numbers that Nketia does, people would be saying, oh my God, he's incredible. I think there's this huge, shiny toy thing with football fans in general, but especially at Arsenal, where people we we just want the new thing. We don't want we don't want that. No, he's like and we know what he is. We we want to mm. get excited about this guy. I think in Ketia, when he starts games, his goal his goal numbers are really good. Like he when Jesus was injured, everyone expected us to drop off last year and we continue to stay top with with Nketiah up front. He got two against United, he got some massive goals and I think when he starts games, he has a big influence. When he comes off the bench, he very rarely scores. Mm. Like, he needs to be starting games. So I think that position doesn't really worry me. Um, the fact that we spread goals so evenly last season, I think kind of makes up for that. Like, Martinelli, Erdegaard, Saka, Jesus, they all got double double figure goals. Um, mm. And I think that kind of makes up for having that not number nine. But obviously, mm. when Man City have Haaland, you do kind of need someone who's going to put up those numbers. <laughs> so I think that is, again, potentially going to be the difference. But I think what we have done is we've solved so much depth in our squad. Like the, What happened at the end of last season, we were knackered. We were absolutely yeah. knackered. We sacked off every other competition to try and get the Premier League. It didn't work because we had injuries. And we like if Saliba was still fit, I think mm. we win the league. Like We just didn't have that depth. 
what we've done this summer, we've now got two players in every position, basically, including goalkeeper, which yeah. is just insanity, yeah. that I think can play and can compete at the top. I think I will never stop talking about how important the signing of Declan Rice is, I think. Like, mm. regardless of what role he's going to play, I think even in a more advanced role, he did really well in the Community Shield. Mm. Um, I think if Thomas Partey is to leave, fingers crossed, he can be very good in defensive midfield. I think, like, he is a massive signing for us. Um, Timber, I'm absolutely delighted with. I've never fallen in love with a player so quickly. He was playing <laughs> out of position in that Community Shield. Yeah. He's never played yeah. left-back before, and he absolutely dominated it. It was incredible. I think the business we've done this summer has been insane and i think it's going to be we are going to be much closer to man city than we were last year and it was only the fact that they beat us twice last year yeah, that meant course. they won the league right yeah. so i think we're going to be much closer but that being said man city i think despite selling big players right Mares mm. has gone gundogan has gone i think the business they've done has been very good i think kovacic is a, such a clever signing yes i think yeah. he's such a clever signing he's i cannot believe chelsea let him go i know they're having this huge reset and they're getting rid of anyone that had anything to do with last season but I think they really could have done with keeping hold of him I think Mm. he does that he plays that midfield role he can do that box to box he can Mm. do the deep sitting defensive work I think he he covers that Gundogan hole a little bit without the goals same extent but he does without the goals Mm. right and then now they're looking at bringing in Pakita for 110 million mental or Lise or Lise or Lise I think Mm. between those two players you kind of make up for where Gundogan went. Yeah. Um, I think the interesting one is Mares going because maybe we'll see Phil Foden starting a bit more now mm-hmm. on right wing, or maybe it'll yeah. be um, Cole Palmer, who looked yeah. amazing when he came on against Arsenal. Yeah, yeah. But I think that right wing role might be a little bit bare now, um, and maybe we, we'll see them bring in a replacement there. Gvardiol at centre-back. Yeah, We saw him at the World Cup. He is going to be the best centre-back in the world next to William Saliva, right? Um, he, I think he's fantastic. So I think that's a great bit of business for them as well. I think there's, but I do think there's just been a slight, slight decline in Man City's quality. Of course quality. there is, yeah. Um, and I think that is where Arsenal can maybe catch up. So that is a very long way of saying I think Arsenal might do it this year. So I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to pin my colours to the, to okay. the mass. Let's do it. I'm going to say <laughs> title winners, Arsenal, and this can be clipped and put on replay at the end of the season <laughs> <laughs> when it all falls apart. Um, nice. So, title winners. Yeah. Adam has gone for Manchester City. Yep. I have gone for Arsenal in the least shocking turn of events ever. Yeah. Um, and we're going to continue down the table and we're going to go for your top four. So, mm. we've got Arsenal and Man City 1 2. Yeah. Which other two teams do you think will be making up the top four? Let's go through their transfer business. Why do you think they're going to be getting there? So I'm going to go with Man United and I'm also going to tip on this occasion, I feel, Liverpool. Um, So the rationale being, I think Man United, when you look now compared to two weeks ago, you kind of look at their kind of business that they've done. And I think this has been the most solid transfer window they've had in years. Like Mm -hmm. there's been an intention for every one of the players they've brought in there's been an upgrade in terms of the personnel. So definitely giving them a lot more depth, um, a lot more kind of penetration as well. Because I feel Onana, we know about what he can do from his inter days. And I think you saw against Man City in that Champions League final, how much of an output he delivers. So he provides more of an output that could drive Man United going forward. Because where... They were kind of lacking from David Gea in terms of his footwork and also where he was kind of delivering the ball. I think you're going to see someone that's going to be a lot more able to deliver an outlet for them as well going forward. So I think that's going to be a real good opportunity for them. And then you think about, I think from my point of view, up top, Rasmus Hoyland. I -hmm. think there's going to be a lot of pressure on him. But if they can get him the service and as well give him the time i think he's going to deliver some really important points for man united during the course of the season i'm still a bit skeptical about mason mount but i genuinely yeah. feel like when you look across the signings that they brought in they've been very astute very clever and definitely in terms of ten hag's philosophy so i think that's really solid um and then talking about liverpool quickly i think there was always going to be this kind of reset with liverpool 
And, uh, you know, I think the quality of players they've brought in so far in Alexis McAllister, as well as Dominic Shabashlai, I think they're going to be really pinnacle to that kind of revolution mm -hmm. of that squad. Um, and I suppose the question to you, Rory, is what do you think about this kind of reliance maybe of putting trust in terms of the younger players in that squad? Because obviously it does feel like they're not necessarily going to make one one more signing because I was surprised to see Jordan Henderson leave. Fabinho's left as well. We all were. But yeah, yeah, this yeah, means yeah. there's an opportunity for Curtis Jones. This means huge opportunity for mm. Trent Alexander-Arnold, who was deployed in that middle of the yep. park area. So does that mean there's a change of philosophy? Then you've obviously got to remember the, the players like Harvey White, isn't it? Or Harvey Elliott even, sorry. Harvey Elliott. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, there's so many different elements, different ways of potentially playing this team as well. Um, it, I think there's going to be a few question marks about the back as well, potentially from my point of view. So, but I would see Man United third and fourth for Liverpool. What about you? Nice. Yeah. No, I think I'm just going to touch on the Liverpool um, and United business. I think I think Liverpool have done really. The fact they haven't added to their back line confuses me a little bit because their defence was so often exposed last mm. season. But then Liverpool fans would turn around and say, well, actually the problem was that there was no cover from midfield and that's why the why, that's why the back line was exposed so much. I think the two midfield additions are incredible. Um, Shobashlai and McAllister, both very, very clever signings. As you yeah. said, I think Shobashlai is 22, McAllister's 24. It feels like this... Is it a third generation of clock players now or second generation of clock players that's starting yeah. to kind of, that he's bringing mm -hmm. through? You know, the club aren't going to sack him. Like, he's there as long as he wants to be there, which is great. Yeah. Like, he's doing an amazing job. So, I think this is him, part of him bringing in that new wave now alongside like Luis Diaz and Javi Alou, who had a bit more, as you mentioned. But I think they're still really missing that Fabinho replacement because neither of those mm -hmm. players um, in Shabashlai and McAllister really do the defensive work. That's not what they do, really. Yeah. I think McAllister can, but he's much better when he's kind of progressive passes looking forward, mm. right? They still need someone that's going to pr protect that back line. Obviously, they've been bartering over Lavia over 5 million for what seems like forever. It yeah. really feels like they could have got that done by now. Chelsea have seemed to be hijacking that one. And they've now been linked that they're hijacking the Caicedo bid from Chelsea. So it, obviously it's an area that they're trying to address. But mm. I think until they sort out that defensive midfield problem, I can't really see them get in that top four. I think Manchester United will be third again. Um, yeah. I think it will be closer than it was last year. Mm. I think you're right. They have made they've made some really good signings. It's a it's a pity in a way that Hoyland is going to be injured for the beginning of the season, yeah. Um, and that they don't really know how long for. It seems like he's got a back injury. They don't know how serious mm. it is, but it's enough to keep him out for a few weeks. I think Mason Mount, as you said, I think he will improve. He'll improve their ability to create attacks, like yeah. and to get into the box. I think they will be able to like. It's just having someone to run onto them because you can't rely on mm. Rashford to be your only attacker. Yeah. I think whilst Hoyland is injured, they still have that hold in the hold in the mm. squad. And you have to remember that Hoyland is twenty years old. He scored nine goals in Serie A last year, and he was injured for most of the season. Yeah. So I think it's he's a player that everyone's excited about. Of course, physically he's a unit. Technically, he's fantastic. Mm but it's going to take time. I don't think it solves Manchester United's problem this season. I think it solves it in two, three seasons yeah. time. So I think we could still see that Manchester United are missing that main striker, that goal mm. scorer. And for that reason, I think they're going to be third. Um, fourth, I don't, I'm going to say Chelsea probably. Okay. Um, I think they are going to have a bit of a better season. Mm -hmm. Um. Although on Twitter, I did say they'd scrape a top 10 finish. So I'm now kind of reeling back on this. <laughs> um, but I think what we're going to see is a very slow season from Chelsea, but they'll just about get there. I think, again, mm. it's going to have to be another patient season for Chelsea fans. Yeah, I think but so. But we know that Poch has got the ability to get the best out of these young players and to um, 
play attractive attacking football and get results. Mm. It'll just be interesting to see if he's been able to adapt alongside the Premier League. He's been away from the Premier League for a long time now. Um, and the Premier League has changed. Football has changed yeah, since yeah. he since he left. So he can't just come in and do what he did at Spurs. It'll be interesting to see if he's able to adapt. Um, I am going to back them to get top four. I think the key signing for them is Nicholas Jackson. I think he's a yeah. really, really yeah, yeah, exciting yeah. striker. He got 20-odd goals in Spain last year for Villarreal um, in a very exciting team under Emery, right? Mm-hmm. Um, under Emery for a bit, right? Um, yeah. And by all accounts in preseason, he's been really... Really, really good for them. Great hold-up play. Technically very good. Very good finisher. So I think he could be that. He's not taken the number nine shirt. So he definitely believes in the Chelsea number nine shirt. <laughs> yeah. um, he's, I think he's number 11. But he's going... I think he could be a really exciting striker to get, there, to get mm. them just into the top four. So my top four are going to be um, Arsenal, Man City, Manchester United, and Chelsea. Um, okay. I'm going to say Liverpool fifth. Um, and yours, Adam, sorry, just to recap. So to recap, Man United in third place and Liverpool in fourth place. Very nice. Now the next one, my mouse has just disappeared. The next one, here we go, is ah, um, which teams will be relegated? Who is not much... Who is not much longer? Not longer for the Premier League Earth. I think two of these teams we could agree on. Maybe three. Yeah. Um, I'm going to let you go first, Adam. Which teams do you think will be relegated this season? I think if you told me a week ago, I'd have a different answer to what I'm giving today. But I think on the reflection of how it's likely to pan out for these two teams in particular, I think they are certs for the relegation zone and they are Wolves and Sheffield United. Um, Sheffield United basically selling trouble. selling the key assets, shall we say, uh, yeah. that helped them to get into the Premier League um, reluctantly. Should we put that yeah, in yeah, there that as was, well? That's a fantastic little addition on Twitter, by the way. <laughs> the passive aggressiveness, I've got a lot of time for it. Um, Blades, I've got Nothing a lot of time to do with it. the fact that you're bankrupt pretty much and need all the money that you can get. <laughs> it's um, still reluctant. It's still yeah, definitely it's still reluctant. very much <laughs> reluctant. So uh, from that point of view, um, you might have a very similar scenario with Wolves at the moment because they mm-hmm. are having to comply with FFP. Um, the only signings to date is the goalkeeper, Tom King, who started off his career at Millwall um, and came via Northampton Town to Wolves. So pretty much a backup goalkeeper there. And then we've got the classic Matt Doherty. He's come back to our shores yes. from Atletico. Return of the King. Return yes. of the King. He's going to come back to his spiritual home of Molyneux. Um, but apart from that, there's not a lot of hope, is there, Rory, for these two? Mm. Because Lopetegui, a few days ago, and basically left the club and um, they bought As in he does. Gary. Carry he O'Neill. only leaves jobs three days before the tournament starts. <laughs> yeah. He's like, uh, no, but he has to wait till the last minute. And I was like, right, I'm out. I'm out. On trend. Um, on trend. You got to respect it in a way. You yeah. got to respect it in a way. Yeah, I think their business is crazy because officially this year they've signed Mateus Cunha. That's gone through for 50 mm. million, right? Um, that, that transfer went through. And they've now signed Bubakar Traore from Mets for 11 million. Um, so they've officially spent 11 million this summer um it does feel like it's so weird and it's it, again like i was saying about potch having to realize how quickly football moves four years ago three years ago wolves were the club mm. that everyone was looking at to replicate like leicester right yeah they were if you want to run a club this is how you do it um now obviously they had an over-reliance on mendez right and it was just yeah, it yeah, was a course. kind of running joke about just portuguese players coming into the club <laughs> yeah. but since they've tried to go away from that mm. the whole thing's kind of fallen apart and their yeah. own scouting system i was watching something about it and they were saying that their scouting system has now tried to expand into um into africa and in south america mm-hmm. and they're trying to set up these networks but while that happens, there is going to be a slump. You can't just find those yeah, players yeah, straight away. It takes time to establish these things, right? And I think what we've seen is a severe lack of quality in their recruitment in the last couple of yeah. years. Like, none of the players that have come in have really done as well as Ruben Neves did, as João Moutinho did, as Raul Jimenez did. And the fact that they've now gone two seasons 
without signing a new striker mm. when everyone that like Jimenez's injury was awful. We all yeah, hope that course. he recovers, but he's not been the same since that no. injury. And for Wolves to not even slightly attempt to try and get a striker mm. beyond Fabio Silva, who the less said about him, the better, like it just feels like a massive failing on the part yeah. of the, of the owners and the backroom staff. And I think now for the, for the Wolves fans, we all kind of thought this bubble would burst when it were, when they were so closely linked to Mendes and it seemed like it wasn't particularly sustainable. Well, now it's kind of happened. I think they're going to be fighting such a hard battle this year. The only, the only bonus they have is that Gary O'Neill's come in fantastic yep. season with Bournemouth last year, but arguably he had a better squad with Bournemouth last year than he has with Wolves now. So I think, mm. The job is bigger for him this year than it was with Bournemouth. Um, Definitely. We'll see if there's any business done towards the end of the window, but they're not really being linked with anyone. Um, the Alex, Alex oh, Scott, Cook, is it? Scott, from Scott Bristol City. From Bristol City, yeah. He's so just gone to yeah. Bournemouth. Uh, they were heavily yeah. linked with him, so they've not been able to get him. It just feels like nothing is really going right for them mm. at the moment. They were able to sell one of their centre-backs to, is it Nathan Collins? Um, Nathan Collins to Brentford. To Brentford quite a yes. lot of money. yeah. Um, so they have brought in a lot of money this year, but as you said, they're trying to keep up with FFP. It does feel like FFP is only being applied to certain clubs. But that being said, if FFP had been applied to Wolverhampton Wanderers when they were in the championship, they wouldn't yes, have been promoted. Of course, yeah. They outspent everybody. They outspent everybody. Um, so I think, you know, there's kind of swings and roundabouts. But I do think Wolves are going to go down. I agree with you on Sheffield United. It, it is, I understand that you want, like you don't want to lose a player for free, right? I get it. You're like, yeah, yeah. last year the contract, we have to get some money. Mm -hmm. That being said, what I wouldn't do is sell to a direct rival that's going to be a, a <laughs> relegation rival. Like I, I understand with Indi, right? He started at Marseille. It's his boyhood. It's his boyhood team. You've got a bit of money. You have to turn around and say, okay, yeah, mm. no, thank you for getting us here, but you can leave. With Sander Burge. I'd have just been. I know, like, do you want an unhappy player in the in the in the squad? I don't know, but I'd have been a bit more tempted to just be like, look, just give us one season, and then you can go, like, yeah. and just try. Because I don't know. Well, no, I know that selling to a direct rival is not a good idea, and for <laughs> just even the mood around the squad and the fans going into the season now, it changes everything. Like, mm. I was talking to my mate Pete, who is a she who's a Sheffield United fan. And he's just like at rock bottom. He's just like, yeah, I can imagine. the club's yeah. always been chaos, but what yeah. is this? Why are we selling into Burnley? There's no need to do this. Um, they have brought in a few players. They're starting to um, get a bit of business done. The issue is that none of them have Premier League experience. They're all quite young. So they're quite young, exciting players, but they are going to be playing their first season in the Premier League. So Austin Trusty from Arsenal, who got Birmingham's player of the season last year in the Championship, they brought him in at centre-back. They brought in Vinny Souza from Lommel, who's a defensive midfielder, 24 years old. Uh, Benetore, 20 years old, a striker from Hacken in Sweden. He got 20 yeah, yeah. goals, I want to say, last year. Um, and they brought in Slimani from Bronby, um, who's another central midfielder, 22 years old. And they brought in a mm -hmm. left back on loan from Twa, who's also 22 yes. years old. The other big yeah. issue for Sheffield United is that a lot of their players last season were on loan uh, from yes. Man City, and they've yeah. not come yeah. back. Yeah. So they've lost basically their best five players from last year. Mm. Um, yeah. I think um, it's Fotheringham, the manager, isn't it? I can't remember the minute. Is it uh, Fotheringham? Heckingbottom. Heckingbottom, that's it. It's so, one yeah. of those strange English names. Heckingbottom <laughs> is a very good manager. Um, so maybe, maybe he can keep them up, but I'm going to say Sheffield United and Wolves. So we both agree on those yes. two. Yeah, yeah, Who is your third? So I think there's like five candidates that could go down. There's a yeah, lot of I think there's quite a few. And I, I'm going to go with this one because I feel like they should have been relegated last season. They did it by oh. the skin of their teeth. And it's can Everton. It's Everton, Everton. Yes. It's Everton. Yeah, yeah. And purely because of the business they've had to do, and also there is going to be a certain over reliance on certain individuals to perform. So I'm talking here, Dominic Who? Calvert Lewin, for example. Okay, right. Because um, yeah, you think about it, he might actually be back fit. Um, and you think about the goal outlet. Uh, they brought in Dan Juma, which was a bit of a weird one, given that he rejected them for Spurs initially. Um, and then he's come back on a permanent, as has Ashley Young. Which, Wait, is he um, alone? Dan no, Juma's alone? 
No, it's permanent. Is it permanent? permanent. Okay. Made permanent. So um, this is a thing. It's just a really strange set of um, transfers, but I don't see how that lifts the kind of levels for them. Like <laughs> they, they, they need a huge amount of impetus in that squad right now. And obviously the critical thing for Everton financially is they need to go through this season, stay up in this league so they can see this new stadium through as well. Because having that stadium in the championship will obviously have reduced revenues. Oh, Bear in mind how much they've spent already on this stadium, which has gone in excess of, I think it's 750 million now yeah, um, yeah. built on the docks. And I think when you think about the other candidates, a few weeks ago, I would have put West Ham potentially in this because uh-huh. of the fact of they were lacking a lot of signings at this stage. But it seems like that might be addressed. I'm not confident that Moyes is still going to be there by the end of the season. I'm sure no, we'll reflect no, on that in no. a minute. Bournemouth, I think I think it's going to be interesting times, but I think they're going to be a very much a total football approach in terms of Adone, who's going to come in, mm-hmm. really change it up. It will have vibes of uh, Eddie Howe because he likes chaos. Yeah. He likes playing football, but not defensively sound. Yeah, and then, yeah. for example, Luton Town, who are everyone's favourites, Rory, to go down. I just think that stadium is going to win them points. Um, yeah, and yeah, yeah. starting to make some yeah. interesting signings. <laughs> that was a very Ross interesting Barkley's signing. Barkley's come yeah, through yeah, the door yeah. with his uh, kind of skin tone to match with the shirt at the moment. So I don't know where he's been <laughs> yeah. recently. He's definitely been out in Turkey. I feel like he's been out in Turkey. <laughs> but yeah. do, do you know, the nice thing is the players they brought in haven't been kind of big players as such. They're kind of rounded players in the respect mm-hmm. of if they go down, there's not going to be any issues of it being like we've overspent, for example. I think it's going to be very I sustainable. Think they're preparing to get promoted again. I yes. think they're literally <laughs> yeah. being like, right, what squad can we build that means that when we get down to the championship, yeah. we can come straight back up? And I think exactly. that's a really sensible way of doing it, honestly. Yeah. Um, and being like, look, we'll obviously give it a go, see what happens, right? Reckon we can stay up. But we need a squad that they're not all just going to sod off the second we get relegated. We need a squad that's going to be like here for the project. And I think Luton have done that incredibly well. Um, I think you're right with Everton. Ashley Young is such an Everton signing. It's such an Everton mm. signing. Um, I think he he's gonna. He's 38 years old. Jesus Christ! I think he's gonna add experience. <laughs> he's he gonna will. add set pieces. He's gonna add like a little bit of you know leadership in that. But I don't know if he's the right back that's going to like, you know, save their season. I think Dan Juma made it pretty clear that he didn't want to be at Everton last time. I don't know why you'd go for him again. If he's yeah. turned, if he's publicly turned you down like that and like changed his mind at the last minute, I don't know why you would be like, exactly. Oh, it's like a desperate, you know, like the, the girls just paid you off in front of your mates. <laughs> and then the next day you go back like, Oh, did you want to lose in public <laughs> yeah. again? Like, I just think, it's a little bit pathetic, um, but we'll see. Maybe maybe you'll get a few goals if he gets a consistent run of form because Spurs barely played him. He came off the bench mm. a couple of times. He had a few run. I think he played maybe three games, started a few games, didn't yeah, do yeah. well, never saw him again. So I think maybe if he's like getting start in every game, maybe we'll see something a bit better from him, but it's not exactly inspiring from Everton, I no. think. Um, they have today been linked with Wilfred Nyonto. I'm mm. very... Don't just don't, don't go, go to there. Everton. Yonto. Just <laughs> yeah. wait. Stay at Leeds. Just don't go to Everton. <laughs> yeah. Just don't go there because it's not going to end well. I don't know. No. Just being in the Premier League isn't necessarily better, right? It's not yeah. like you can just stay at Leeds, get promoted, and then get that big move after a great season. Like maybe if you go to Everton, everything's on fire. You have an average <laughs> season, and you end up at Frosinone or something because nobody else will take you. I don't know. It's just. It doesn't seem like a good idea to me for him to go there, but he has been linked there. So maybe that's a bit of... But for Everton, that could be a good signing. He's a very exciting player. He's got the end product, Mm. very direct, by far the best player at Leeds. Like, I think could be playing for a top six team. (laughs) Like, very, very good. So maybe Everton aren't quite done yet. But the team, I'm going to say, that goes down, I was going to say Everton, but I want to be different to you so i'm gonna say here we go palace i'm gonna say crystal palace i think now this has been kind of in the back of my head for a while but i think roy hodgson did an incredible job last year and like really turned around what was a bit of a depressing season and kind of got that run of form together got him a few goals but they've just lost wilfred zaha and they've not replaced him 
And it's not possible to replace Wilfred Zaha for a club like Palace, I don't think. They need to assign a player that can do that in a couple of years. And that's what they've done with this Brazilian lad, Franca, I think is how you say it. They have, yes. Um, yeah. We talk to our friends on the Smoking Snake podcast. If you want to hear about Brazilian league football, go check them out. They really know their stuff. Um, and they were talking about really exciting player, really mm. exciting player, great future, but maybe not someone who's ready for the Premier League right now. Um, okay. So I think if he's the replacement for Zaha, that could be a little bit of an issue and they're going to be missing a lot of goals. Like Zaha gets so many goals and assists for them. Yeah, He's their I'm... main attacking threat. And I think what we saw last year with Palace already was that they were struggling to score goals. I think Eze and Elise are super creative, can create yeah, lots yeah, of chances, yeah. but Odson Edward isn't particularly great at finishing them. No, so I think we're going to see a massive lack of goals at Palace. Um, and I think maybe that will be what kind of I'm going to caveat down, that. Unfortunately. I'm going to counteract what you've just said, though. I feel like they're waiting for certain business to happen for them to mm-hmm. bring in some players on loan. There's rumours of Sam Gallagher coming back um, on oh, loan. Oh, Conor Gallagher, which, yeah. Okay. Or Conor Gallagher, even, sorry. Um, they've obviously brought in Jefferson Lerma on a free from Bournemouth, yeah. which I think in the middle of the park will be quite useful. He did contribute quite a few goals last season as well, if you remember. Mm. So, you know, I think that's going to be an interesting outlet. Um, I feel like, though, Zaha, whilst I appreciate he did score the majority of the goals for Palace last season, I think he was the focal point and not necessarily always the end products. His end products mm. was a bit lacking at times. And I feel that kind of taking away you know, that reliance on him means players like Eze and Elise might contribute a lot mm-hmm. more into okay. the game. So from my point of view, I feel that's likely to happen. And I feel like there's still business to be done with Palace. I feel okay. like we'll still strengthen. They recently uh, let one of their younger prospects plunge, go back into a team lower leagues. I've forgotten. Carlisle, I think, I think United. it was. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it feels like there is going to be someone bought in up top still. I feel like they're just looking or waiting potentially patiently for certain moves to happen before they uh, make a mark. So before the end of the transfer window, I suspect they will strengthen in that department. Um, but there is a lot of ifs and caveats on that. So personally, I would say Palace are, are going to do enough to stay safe. Personally, I okay. think the likes of Bournemouth are more likely to be in that mix personally. Um, but yeah, let's wait and see, Rory. Let's wait and see. We That's will see. That's my take, hot though. take. I apologize, Eagles. Um, but I've been worried about you all summer because I think oh, you really need to do something soon, guys. Um, obviously, the transfer window doesn't shut for another three weeks. So this is all us based on business now. But Palace go down. Nice. So the next one, before we take a very quick break, who do you think, and I'm, this could be done super quickly. It could take <laughs> roughly five seconds. But who do you think is going to be top scorer in the league? I think it's going to be Haaland. Me too. <laughs> what a surprise. Well, that was easy. Um, yeah, I think Erling Haaland, that's going to be fairly obvious, isn't it? Um, yeah. I don't think, I don't know who's going to get close. Who'll be second? Let's make it interesting. Who'll be second um, top goal I think scorer? It might be Salah. Salah, I think he's going to mm-hmm. be a bit reliant. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see maybe Jackson behind them too yeah. as well, potentially. I think there'll be a lot of goals contributed from him. But yeah, certainly I think that top three sounds like it's going to be the mix for the end of the season, potentially, at some yeah. point. Um, it'll be very interesting to see if Kane is still there. So he might be part of the goal mix. Um, True. But failing that, yeah, I'd imagine Rashford is also potentially pushing mm. up there because, yeah, I, I think as long as he stays fit, then potentially there's an outlet. And obviously there's that kind of rest aspect with Hoyland yeah. as well. So it'd be very interesting. But yeah, what about you? Uh, any other? I think it's probably going to be Salah. I think Salah in a quiet season mm. gets 25 goals and people think he's dropped off. Like, I think yeah, it, exactly. will be, it will be Hoyland and Salah. Um, but I'm going to say, I think we see a lot more goals from Gabriel Martinelli this year. I think we really mm. see him get a real cutting edge i think we could see him pushing pushing towards the top scorer list fingers crossed well guys we're going to take a little bit of a quick break now give you a bit of a rest and we're going to come back with best signing worst signing best manager and surprise team after this hi my name is Dimitri constantopoulos and you're listening to the anglo-italian podcast and here we are we are back we're back yeah. and it is time for the last four 
of our predictions, which are going to be the best signing of the season, the worst signing of the season, the best manager, and the surprise team. Now, starting with the best signing, I'm going to give us some suggestions to whet the appetite from some of our valued listeners. Um, AFC Finner says best signing, Anana. At Cam the Man 22 says best signing Harvey Barnes for Newcastle, which is an mm. interesting one. Um, Footlol Podcast says Telemans, which I really like. Mick Horton says Tonali. And then Angie's son, great name, says Yuri and Timber. Even better suggestion. Mm. I like that a lot. Um, Adam, any of those match your predictions? Um, I had a group of them, but I think the one that I'm going to lead with is a player that you mentioned earlier, and that is Mateo Kovacic. I think for wow. the price okay. that you know Man City paid for, and this is what they seem to be very clever at doing every season, it feels like. It feels like there's one of these players that are bought for around the 30 million mark, and they go under the radar until where they have one really good season and then we're kind of talking about them as being 80 million plus Mm -hmm. basically and it just feels like like you said how did Chelsea let this one go away for such a low amount of money when you consider the quality that Kovacic has what he brings to the team and you think about the current midfield that Chelsea have for example are they naive i mean what what did he put do wrong like he feels like he's slotted in really nicely with man city already and uh, you know i know we've talked about him not necessarily being gundogan but certainly he fills in that gap and ensures that they consolidate i suppose and Mm -hmm. um potentially go again for the season so i think for the amount of money that's spent there then that is really astute um but yeah what about yours is there any of those that kind of wet your fancy or is there someone outside of that mix that you'd like I'm to I'm just looking through and I think Anana from ASC Vinners mm. is a very good shout because I think yeah, yeah. despite that shocker he had in the friendly that's kind of part yeah, of his game his. that's what not happens his. but yeah. he's a fantastic goalkeeper we saw it in the Premier League uh, we saw it in the Champions League just how good a goalkeeper he can be so yeah. I think he it's a massive position solved for Manchester United I think we're going to mm. see such a big improvement in goals that they concede and then being able to build attacks. Because obviously last year, Manchester United, when they lost like 4-0 to Brentford and they had those really awful run of games, it all kind of stemmed from an inability to get the ball forward and yeah. the teams being able to pressure De Gea. And I think now that shouldn't be such an such a, a problem. We're going to see just a much more calm back line. I think it's kind of a shame that we won't see Harry Maguire in this back line because I think a calm goalkeeper will probably be a calming influence on him and we might actually see an upturn in form on him. I think Anana really will bring a bit more calm to the team, maybe not to the supporters in the, mm. in the stands who will be a little bit more panicked, I think. So I think Anana is a very good shout. But I'm trying not to say an Arsenal player because I think it's just a little bit predictable. I do think Yuri and Timber is going to surprise everybody. Um, but I'm going to say, even though it's a lot of money, so it's not exactly a bargain, no. I'm going to say Shobashlai, um for Liverpool. Ooh, I think yes, it's course. a player that we really, again, 22 years of age, he's crushed it everywhere he's been. Um, he scores absolute bangers. Mm. Um, he fills in that kind of box-to-box role for Liverpool. I think yeah. that kind of dynamic runs from deep. I think we're really going to see him absolutely explode. So I think mm. he's a player I'm super excited to see in the Premier League. When Liverpool signed him, I think I said it when on one of our pods or when we were on the Twitter space, I said... I'm just excited that he's in the Premier League. I'm just glad he's in the Premier League because he's a player that I want to watch. Like I don't watch that much Bundesliga and I'm just happy I'll get to see him every week. So I'm really excited for him. I think I'm going to say he's my best signing of the season, Um, Dominic Schoberschlei. And it's, as I said before, Mm. great fun to say. So great name. Good work. Um, The next one, worst signing. Now, we have some suggestions. Again, AFC Finners, James Madison. Um, Cam the Man says, anyone United sign. Um, (laughs) Football Podcast says, Flecken, the goalkeeper who is now at Brentford, right? Um, Mick Houghton says, Kai Havertz. I'm going to try to not Mm. take offense at that one. And Angie's son says, in direct contrast to you, says Kovacic will be the worst Ooh, signing of the season. Okay. Um, Adam, who is your worst signing of the season, do you think? Um, I mean, it's hard to 
look beyond Everton signings at the moment. <laughs> I was um, going to say Ashley Young. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's a real struggle, isn't it? Because I'm just trying to think. I mean, even the one I mentioned, Tom King, uh, like Wolves, I feel sorry for him because he's not necessarily that bad. Um, but no, no, no. I'm going to go for something random. Um, and I don't know whether this is, again, Nottingham Forest spending a lot of money on this player, but Anthony Alanga, um, he's gone for 15 million. Uh, to Nottingham Forest, so it feels like they've been diddled again in the transfer market for this player. Um, this is very much a punt of a signing, I would say. I don't mm-hmm. know necessarily whether he adds that kind of upper kind of quality. When you consider the players that they did bring in January versus what they've got now, for example, so they got the likes of Ola Aina, we've got obviously um, your very own Turner moving on from Arsenal mm-hmm. as well. Um, but yeah, I just feel like Alanga, I, d- I don't know what he solves in Nottingham Forest, right? Because Nottingham it Forest It feels like need... an opportunity signing, wasn't yeah. it? Like he came on the market and they went, okay, we'll just take a punt on this one. Exactly. And when you consider how much money they spent already, you would have thought FFP wise, there's 15 million there. Don't spend it on that. Spend it on like a defender, spend it on a striker, right? Um, mm-hmm. I think there's going to be a lot of um, potential kind of scraping around to uh, ensure that they've got someone come through the door in January. And I feel like Alanga's going to be one of those that probably will go the opposite way, potentially mm-hmm. end up as a loan spell somewhere. So I feel like if that doesn't turn out to be a good signing in the first few weeks, I think there'll be a lot of pressure on Steve Cooper. There'll be a lot of pressure from the crowd as well on him. Um, yeah, I just don't know what he does. He doesn't inspire mm-hmm. me, and it feels like a bit of a wasted amount of money. But might be harsh. Might be really harsh on the guy. I think there was some promise right at Man United, but I think he yeah. started very well. He started very mm. well for them. But when they, when the team and the supporters were really looking for any sign of brightness and promise, they really latched onto him as like this exciting yeah. guy who was direct and kind of you know ran for the shirt etc but i don't know how much of an end product he's got i kind of i kind of agree with you there but i cannot see beyond i'm not going to say ashley young because he's a great great professional he's had a great career so i'm going to say dan juma (laughs) because i think (laughs) it's just going to be it's got disaster written all over it um everton are going to be a basket fire and i think he's going to be part of that basket fire so Mm. nice and quickly yeah all now dan juma is going to be my worst signing of the season good um next up we have best manager of the season starting again now um Stephen cole says best manager unai emery uh we have afc finners best manager ten hog um cam the man says best manager potch football podcast best manager pep um and mick horton best manager unai emery and Andrew son best manager Mikel. Oh, Teta. I think he might be an Arsenal fan. Um, although he's called Angie's son. Anyway, um, Adam, who do you think is going to be the manager of the season? Uh, might be predictable here, but um, Pep, I, I can't see beyond oh, really? Pep, unfortunately. As much as I do like Arteta, I feel um, Pep is just clever in terms of when it comes to the business end they seem to go on this momentum. He knows what he's got to deliver. They always seem to be well drilled. You saw it with Man City towards the end of the season. Seems really super focused. I think obviously now that he's got over that kind of little bit of a mountain with the Champions League, they can relieve themselves. They can breathe easily. You know, there isn't that mountain to climb to ensure that they get the Champions League now. It's all about just maintaining momentum. And I think what you'll find with Man City going forward is maybe an evolution of these players because like we've said Mares is going in the next 12 months I suspect there will be a few players that might decide their futures as well because we've heard rumours about Bernardo, we've heard rumours about Kevin De Bruyne but it doesn't seem to phase like Pep. If you look at the players mm-hmm. that they've managed to bring in, they're still kind of revolutionising that side, they're bringing in some younger players as well from the youth academy so I feel like Pep seems to um, still like rejuvenate this side he seems to um, always get them in a competitive edge and you can't say that he's ever really had a position where they've ever struggled any of his sides appreciate he's probably been fortunate on some occasions because of the amount of money he's got to spend the qualities of players but I just feel like that momentum is going to carry on Um, but I think there's some fair shouts in the mix as well from Mm. uh, our listenership as well so uh, Rory what about you? 
Um, I think I'm torn between two. I'm torn between two. So I'm really excited about Aston Villa this year. I'm yeah. really excited yeah, about yeah, Aston Villa yeah. this year. I think the business they've done has been fantastic. Um, Tielemans coming in, Diaby from Leifekus and Pau Torres. Like, Emery yeah. is building a hell of a team there. Um, I think it's just super exciting. And I think we could see Aston Villa push into the Europa League places this year. And maybe even at one point have a shout at top four. I think at one point mm. people will be saying, can they do it? I think they're really, we're really going to see them push on this year. They obviously, since he came in, I think they were third or fourth in the form table um, in the Premier League since Unai Emery came in. So he obviously had such an incredible start building on it, shaping the squad even more to his liking. Um, getting the best out of the likes of Ollie Watkins. Um, and is Danny Ings back there now, or is he at West Ham? No, Arm? he's gone to West Ham. He's West Ham. Um, yeah. But getting the best out of Ollie Watkins. Um, and I think there's a really, he's going to have a massive shout at getting it. Also, mm. um, a manager that I'm super excited about, we've really kind of, we've kind of quickly, I think you quickly mentioned him, is um, uh, Iriola. I need to say it properly. Yeah. Iriola um, at Bournemouth. Now, he's a manager who is, heavily inspired by Marcello Bielsa, um, played under him uh, during his career, did incredible things with Rayo Vallecano uh, in yeah. La Liga. Vallecano, like, I lived in Madrid. They're from an area called Vallecas in Madrid. It is tiny. They are like the fourth team in Madrid, right? You've got Real Madrid, Atletico, Atletico. you've got Tafe, and then yeah. you've got Rayo Vallecano, right? And he managed to get them promoted from the Secunda into La Liga. And then two back-to-back 12th um, place finishes mm. on a shoestring on a shoestring budget, really, and just the style of football he plays is fantastic. He says the quote I think was he he loves chaos, right? Yes. Yeah. So um, he really there. I think they led the league in the most um, final third turnovers, right? So mm. their high press is relentless and it's targeted and it is drilled. But what he manages to do as well, to an extent, is he has a very no-nonsense defense. So they're very hard, very physical. Zonal marking. So he's not gone for the man marking of Bielsa. He's not gone full Bielsa. But he's got some zonal marking. It does mean that it leaves them slightly less perceptible to counterattacks. It means they can be a little bit more, I say a little bit, a little bit more defensively sturdy. I think Bournemouth are going to absolutely fly this season. I think mm. we're really going to see him kick on. And yeah, I yeah. think people are going to be really... This is the introduction. This is him coming to the Premier League. Nobody will know about him. And I think by the end of the year, people like when Dezel will be turned up. I think people are going to be talking about him a lot by the time this season is done. So all that to say, I'm going to go Unai Emery, just because he's ex-Arsenal and I want it to go well for him. I'm going to go best manager, Unai Emery, shortly followed by um, Iriola. Iriola? Iriola. Iriola. Cannot get that name right. Anyway, next one in the (laughs) final category is Surprise Team. So, um, some of our nominations. Stephen Cole says Aston Villa. AFC Finners says Burnley. It's an interesting shout. Mm -hmm. Cam the Man says Everton. Come on, you are so... uh, Surprising in which way? Surprisingly good or surprisingly shit? Depends how you want to interpret it, I suppose. Um, Footlow Podcast says none. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mick Houghton says Aston Villa. And Angie's son says Bournemouth. Uh, So, a bit to back me up. But Adam, who is going to be your... Are you taking it surprisingly good or surprisingly bad? Which way are we going? Uh, so let's go surprisingly good. Surprisingly, surprisingly good. Let's be positive, yeah, right? Let's be positive. I think we, let's be positive. I think I'm going to go with Villa. Villa. I've, I've, I've decided, even on that spot, I'm still deciding between two. <laughs> yeah, you can see uh, it. I, I saw could... you making the decision. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So Villa. Villa, just because, like you say, is such an exciting period of time. Like we we said this last summer when Gerald was there, so I'm hoping <laughs> oh, yeah, this is yeah, fair wow, infa- wow. impetus for them. But yeah, genuinely, I feel like look, one of the things that's been very apparent is that Uno Emery's been playing around with formations in preseason. Mm. They've obviously have a good set of players now. I mean, if you look at the depth of the quality that they've got now, it's pushing for that top five, top six mix. Now you cannot argue that they haven't got the players. And if you think about how well drill they'll be like we talked about the Bournemouth setup you thinking about Emery he is so kind of he'll change the kind of process during the game so the fact is that 
they might appear to go with one formation, but they'll change like 20 minutes later, which confuses the hell out of your opponents. And I think mm -hmm. that's going to keep a lot of his opponents in terms of the managers really thinking and second guessing. There'll be times where that will become very frustrating sometimes, I think. Um, but, you know, if you look at the teams that he led with Villarreal, for example, during their European run as well, you can sense that there's something that's going to come to fruition at Villa. I think the only thing that may be a hindrance to them is the over-reliance on Ollie Watkins, because if he mm -hmm. does get injured, then who's going to pick up the slack? Um, yeah. But I'm really excited by Musa Diaby, for example. I think he's a really exciting player. I'm surprised Newcastle didn't get that over the line yeah, yeah. for whatever reason. Um, and yeah, if you think about who they brought in otherwise, I'm I'm just genuinely very excited about what Villa can achieve. But also, just to put it out there, I think Burnley are going to be very interesting this season. Mm -hmm. I'm not expecting them to be the high half of the table, but I think they will do respectably well because of the philosophies that company has. And it'll be interesting to see how company kind of adapts to the Premier League because I think he knows too well that he can't approach it in the same way that he approached it in the Championship. But the philosophy is there. They've got some good players there. And yeah, he's putting a lot of faith into younger players, Rory. Mm, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because they have to go for a t from a team that have dominated a league to now a team that aren't going to dominate games. Yeah. And it can be quite a hard transition. We see it with Norwich every single time they come up. They absolutely, apart from last season, I suppose, <laughs> they absolutely walk the championship, then come up and go, oh, crap, we have to learn how to play football again. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how company in his first management job is able to adapt to that. But I think you're right. Burnley are going to be relatively comfortable. Um but so that I'm not too much um, riding on Aston Villa uh, or twerking for Aston Villa, as people say <laughs> on Twitter, um, I'm going to say Bournemouth. I'm going to say Bournemouth. I know okay. they were kind of a surprise team last year. They were, well, they weren't. They, were, they weren't kind of. They were a surprise were. team last year. I'm going to say, yeah, they go one further and surprise people even more this year. Um, I think we could see a top half finish. I think we could see Ooh. a... Okay. 10th, 9th. I'm not going to go 8th. That's a bit brave. But 10th that or 9th, very I, think brave. We could see, I think we could see Bournemouth really kick on and surprise a lot of people. I really do like this manager. I really just, enjoy watching his football. Just curious, if you're putting them there, where do you see Brentford? I think they're really going to struggle. Okay. Without, without um, his name's completely gone, Ivan Tony. Ivan Tony. yeah. I I honored like I know they're super well run and like Thomas Frank is a great manager, but I don't know how a club like that repl replaces a player like that when that player will know that ultimately that the guy they're there to replace is going to come back, right? If you know what I mean, it's like a really difficult thing. I, to... I get that, I get that, but I think the rumors are, and it's quite a funny tweet that we went through this week was uh, Nico Gonzalez going to potentially oh, Fiorentina like, to yeah, Brentford. Yeah. I think if he pulls that <laughs> off as a move, uh, let's just put, forget about the tweet, but if he manages to pull this off, I mean, that'd be a hell of a signing for Brentford. That's a great signing, honestly. Genuinely. That'd be an amazing signing. But yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, we it would be an amazing signing. We might have to retweet that tweet that we're talking about, Rory. But I'm gonna, yeah, well, uh, I, I think they... Oh, this is going to go, fuck it. <laughs> they, they like to always say, hashtag Prem face. I'm going to start yes. up a thing of hashtag Serie A face, which is just <laughs> yeah. bitter reactions to the Premier League. <laughs> just bitter people crying about how Serie A isn't marketed better. Um, it really is quite <laughs> tiring to deal with. But yeah, Nico Gonzalez would be a hell of a signing. So fingers crossed, just for the reaction tweet that that signing would provoke. Uh, fingers crossed that happens. Uh, but yeah, I think... That that would be that would be a big sign, mm. uh, but I think Brentford, yeah, they're really going to struggle. They're not going to be, they're not going to be top half. I don't think just because Ivan Tony okay. is such a huge, huge influence for them. He's like the whole team is built around him, and they found themselves in a really strange situation. I don't think they'll be anywhere near danger. I think Thomas Frank and the squad is too good for that. Mm. But I think they might have a bit of a season they might want to forget. Um, but that is our predictions done, guys. Um, it all kicks off. It today does. as you're listening to it um we do have the return of vincent company well kind of uh vincent <laughs> company hosting um his former team as burnley take on manchester city friday night i'm mm -hmm. gonna do english time 
eight o'clock kickoff. Uh, then on Saturday, uh, we have Arsenal hosting Nottingham Forest. Mm. It begins. I'm emotionally not ready for this. As Matt Turner comes back straight back. Straight away. I wonder if he stayed in London, if he bothered to go up to Nottingham. Probably not. I don't know if there's any point. <laughs> um, he will be returning to the Emirates as Arsenal host Nottingham Forest to kick off their season. That is at half past 12 um, to get the Saturday kicked off. We have Sheffield United taking on Crystal Palace in the three o'clock kickoffs. The rest of the three-cock kickoffs. We have Bournemouth versus West Ham in the Harry Redknapp derby. We have Brighton taking on Luton, Everton taking on Fulham, and then the late kickoff on Saturday, half past five, Newcastle versus Aston Villa. Can I just say I'm really delighted we managed to do a preview without mentioning Newcastle once. And then on <laughs> Sunday we have two o'clock kickoff, Brentford versus Tottenham. Half past four kickoff, Chelsea versus Liverpool, and then the eight o'clock on Monday. Manchester United yeah. versus Wolves. That is your first Premier League weekend. Guys, I hope you're ready. I'm definitely not ready. Adam, are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's get oh. it going. I can't hack it. My emotions, I can't hack it. Well, <laughs> as always, guys, thank you for joining us. Um, if you're on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe. Mm. If you are listening, give us a rating on whatever app you are listening mm. on. Uh, give us a follow on there. Obviously, five star does help. Ratings really make a difference. So just take 10 yes, seconds do. out of your life. It will boost us up the charts a little bit and get us a little bit more visible. So chuck us a five star rating. And yeah, we would really appreciate it. Um, follow us on Twitter at Italian Anglo Pod, on Instagram at Anglo Italian Pod. Um, and we will see you. It's all a bit over the, the all over yeah. the place at the minute because we're still on holiday, etc. But keep an eye on our socials, and we'll tell you when we're coming back. The Monday live streams will be back in September, probably. Um, so for now, it will just be Thursdays. But keep an eye on our socials. Adam, anything to say before I give them the first quote of the season? Um, just in addition, something that we uh, as a pod are basically asking you don't have to do it so don't feel you have to but uh, we are going to put like a little pot essentially to the side for donations for the pods mm -hmm. because as you can imagine this costs a lot for us it comes out of our own pockets so our own time as well so we will appreciate any donations uh, we're not going to make this kind of a chargeable pod let's put it that way um, but we'd appreciate any donations going forward if you've got like a spare pound that you can share for the month that'll be really appreciated yeah. so um, exactly yes. it just yeah it, it, it all does come out of our pocket i don't want to panhandle and like you know yeah. but yeah anything would be welcome anything would be welcome so thank you guys and thanks for the support as always we're mm. delighted to be back for the season and our first quote it comes from google for the first time we have a quote from <laughs> google and it is simply what does charlie kane do Charlie Kane is the director of the Harry Kane Company, managing the football business and charity interest of England captain and Tottenham Hotspur striker Harry Kane. Thank you, guys. We will see you soon. <laughs>